Let me tell you a totally true story that happened to me just a couple of months ago. I was in my car at an intersection waiting for the light to turn green when a Volkswagen went careening through the amber light and straight into a BMW that was turning at that intersection. Without thinking, I got out of my car and ran over to the accident to see if the people in the smashed up cars were okay. And well, they were both in serious pain and shock. And it was in that moment that I realized the incredible pressure, but also privilege it is to be that first line of care and human contact for someone involved in such a major accident. It was super intense, but I now understand the calling that has probably brought you here to this video for advice on how to do well in your EMT training. And I promise I will not disappoint you because today I'm talking to Geraldine Price, a nationally registered and certified paramedic and EMS instructor with 33 plus years experience under her belt. And in this interview, she's going to give you the key to acing your EMT training so that you can do a much better job than I did as a frontline responder. Okay, Jerry, let's start with a brief overview of the NREMT's cognitive and psychomotor exams. What can candidates expect from them? Uh, some fantastic stuff. Uh, the NREMT psychomotor the skills exam uh, should be taught to you during the length of the class or to the student excuse me during the length of the class and they start with basic kind of static skills how to set up an oxygen tank um, how to provide airway ventilations on a on an airway mannequin mm -hmm. and other things like that but it progresses up to a more dynamic skill of medical assessment and trauma assessments mm -hmm. and then we're incorporating all of those static skills that were taught throughout the class to incorporate into those kind of scenarios or simulations, depending on how the school teaches. Yeah. So with that information, um, the flashcards that we did were based on some of those processes mm -hmm. as far as because National Registry will take the cognitive, co excuse me, cognitive exam and use those processes um, in testing. Mm. as well so the textbooks pretty much all of them out there are covering those processes mm. and then in the process of teaching um, and then testing on an online written exam that information is still testable material okay so the exam is taken online yes yeah. uh, they'll have to go to a pearson AccuView testing center okay yes yeah. yes i don't know if you're familiar with those at all um similar for that's nursing, all the yeah yeah i'm sorry it's similar for nursing, the NCLEX uh, yes. nursing program is yeah. very similar. And and Pearson Academy, all they do is take tests or provide tests, and they are uh, very stringent about how they do that. Mm -hmm. So okay. typically they'll have you walk in. Some of them do retinal scans. Some of them will do fingerprints. Wow. Uh, they will ask you to empty your pockets. So there's no point bringing any personal items in. Mm -hmm. If you do, they'll put a key, basically give you a key and put your stuff in the locker. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, you are videotaped the whole time. You walk into a room, they do a 360 scan. Wow. It sounds really intense, but if they're not prepared for that. Well, prison um, doesn't. <laughs> you know, but they'll do a 360 scan, and then a, a facilitator will walk you to the computer, sit yeah. down, get you logged on. Uh, there'll be a couple of things you'll need to enter, and then your exam will start. Okay. Uh, the online exam is very dynamic. It's a, it's a, if you answer a question, right it kind of starts off with medium level questions mm -hmm. if you answer right it'll probably ask you a more difficult question okay uh, once that shows that in that category let's say airway breathing circulation um, in that category once you achieve a 70 percent it stops that category from testing oh. so and if you get the first medium question wrong then it'll give you easier questions until it can move into that. Yeah. But what's fun about it <laughs> is that it's never sequential. It's not the first 10 questions are airway management. It goes all over the place. Right. Um, so you don't necessarily know um, how well you did on the previous question. And yeah. then to make it even more intense, there's a counter, <laughs> a clock that's counting. Um, and then there's another one that's counting how many questions you've answered. Oh, so. Wow. Um, We've had students be successful, anything over 50 questions and be done um, up to 150 and still pass. Wow, yeah. So it just depends on their their level of knowledge and mm -hmm. how to take tests appropriately because it is, like I said, a dynamic question. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And then just to go back to the, the sort of skills test, how is that, sorry, how is that assessed? I, I didn't get that. That's okay. The training centers, like I said, depending on um, so much states, but National Registry is a guideline for us. It's not mm. a federal agency. It's nothing like that, but they provide EMS education guidelines. Okay. Um, but it's pretty much overseen by all, or 
all of the nation, the United States uses uses it as an oversight guideline policy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in that, they like we said, we teach them the, the is- isolated skills, mm-hmm. and then the training for training center can decide whether or not to say yes, you're proficient at this time. A lot of them will wait until the end of class and do a, a psychomotor skills exam, okay. where you have to do all of those things again yeah. and be successful at it. Yeah, uh, as well as medical and trauma, doing the more dynamic assessment. So it's really up to the training centers. Um, we recently switched to doing simulation training. Okay. So we take all of those isolated skills and they have to individually perform taking care of a patient from the yeah. time they arrive to addressing the patient to the time that they drop them off at the hospital. Okay. Um, so there's cool. a time frame involved, but different training centers do it different ways. Right. And all ways are accepted as long as they understand those skills and can perform them. Okay, great. All right, well, in terms of emergency medicine theory, there is a lot that students need to learn. So as an experienced EMS instructor, what's your best advice, not only for understanding the information, but actually remembering it? Oh, there's so much. Yeah. Um, I'm not a good reader. I personally, <laughs> I hate reading. <laughs> so to look, I totally emphasize with a student that goes through a chapter or three pages and doesn't remember anything that they read. Right. So to go through the book, um, in the beginning of all of their textbooks, they have objectives that were written by educational standards in EMS at their level. So I suggest that they go through, read the objectives in the beginning of the chapter and have a goal when they actually read. Yeah. So write down a couple of questions that you want to get addressed, go through the tra- chapter. I also suggest reading out loud as much as possible, mm-hmm. um, but then address that question, find it and write it down. It gives you a better purpose than just mindlessly reading Um, so i'm big on highlighters um, underlining um, sticky notes anything anything that can help them but flashcards as well there's so much in in those textbooks and i'm a firm believer that if we understand the terminology Mm. if we have a good a good solid understanding of the terminology that we'll understand what the question is what the goal is So reading, um, anything that helps. We have online platforms with textbook companies, Mm. Um, the aids, the flashcards, um, study groups. I'm big on on processes and then cutting those apart like a puzzle and then trying to fit them back together again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if if I think of something more, I'll let you know. But anything that helps them. And I initially, for myself and my students, do a learning assessment the first day of class. So I have an understanding as well as the other students have an understanding of how individuals learn so mm-hmm. that they can help facilitate their learning process with better understanding yeah. of each other. It's it's really the difference between sitting quietly in a corner reading and actually engaging with the material and reframing it in a way, you know, whether you're creating flashcards or, or a concept maps, um, you know, or working with other students, you're actually taking the material and, you know, integrating it into your brain and, and interacting yes. with it, engaging with it. So that's really what's crucial. And, and that's and what you've said. done with Brainscapes yeah. in our yeah. EMP flashcards. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned mind maps too, which are, are fantastic. Yeah. But there again is so much that the students can do to help themselves individually. And like we said, reading out loud, as mm-hmm. well as I suggest they do some sort of physical, like a kinesthetic activity, yeah, yeah. Um, something that can be duplicated in the Pearson Active Center. Right. So if, if pen tapping is their thing, that will drive the person next to them absolutely <laughs> crazy. Um, if toe tapping and that unconscious leg movement, yeah. that'll drive the person next to them crazy. So typically I suggest they do something with their fingers or take a hair tie around their wrist and just something they can physically do while they're reading out loud, hearing themselves, finding those questions and answers and hopefully retaining the information longer. Mm-hmm. Uh, National Registry, when you actually do take your cognitive excuse me, yeah, your cognitive online exam, uh, they will give you a blank piece of paper and a pencil. Oh, nice, okay. Um, strongly recommended that a, a brain dump, mm. um, that you write down everything and that that may be advantageous when they actually take the online exam. Mm-hmm. And something they should probably know too is they can't skip questions or go backwards. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. so it's one question at a time and it just, it only moves forward. That's, that's awful because what, you know, you must feel so frustrating later on, like, oh, wait, I remember the answer. And then, and then you've moved (laughs) past Or that next question gives you the answer to the previous one. Oh, okay. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, let's, uh, let's move on to the practical emergency skills. How can students commit them to muscle memory? Repetition. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and that is our goal in EMS with so many things mm -hmm. um, because running calls becomes dynamic. So if you're, your basic skills, uh, how to provide bag valve mask ventilation, how to do the hand placement, how to squeeze the bag, that the more you do that, I'm, I'm huge on the more we assess happy, healthy, uh, the sooner that when we see something that's wrong or doesn't feel right when we go to ventilate the patient, mm -hmm. that we may not know exactly what it is right then, but we can go, that's, that's not normal and then address it. But repetition is the only way right. to get this through. And and there's no way in the time of an EMT class that we can accomplish mastery. Right. This, but I look at it as proficiency is when a student is providing bag valve ventilations for a patient and they're telling me about the movie they watched last night or the dinner, because they are not thinking about what they're doing. Mm. They're literally just, the muscle memory has kicked right. in and they're, and they're doing it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, dreaming about it always, about, about quarter of the way into class, they start dreaming about these skills in the process. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm also real big on visualization. If okay. we visualize um, the end process, mm. as far as completion, that's fantastic. But we also have to visualize the, the process, yeah. each step. And these skills are broken down very specifically step by step. Mm -hmm. So that's very helpful. But then to get familiar with those skills and just run them through your head, what are you going to do? And I've had students that you'll see will make hand gestures that, that they're actually with their eyes closed performing yes. the task. Wow. So it's fantastic. And all of the research says that that's improved retention, sped yeah. up learning, right. it's been, been good. Oh, cool. All right, so from a broader perspective, what are the right habits to have throughout EMT school school that will set you up for success, not only on your, during your exams, but also your career? Curiosity. <laughs> huh? Curiosity, that would oh, be the first cool. thing that I like would come that. to mind. Yeah, um, there's so much with the human body that is absolutely fascinating. Mm. Um, anatomy and physiology classes, it's like, why do I have to keep taking these? Mm -hmm. But they keep discovering more things or they're they're renaming things instead mm. of the physician that found this specific body part and named him after himself. Now they're being more accurate in naming. So curiosity as far as how those systems work and, and what is the end result? And if there's something that interrupts it, yeah. how does that progress and, and what can you do about it? Yeah. So curiosity and, and always they need to continually be digging for further education. Yes. The EMT program is an introductory program. There is a massive learning curve once they're done with class and certified. Yeah. So always having that curiosity, being involved, communicating uh, with your partners, with the physicians, the nurses, the other techs that you're working with. They have so much information. So keeping an open mind, um, not getting stuck in ruminating or fear. Mm. Everybody, everybody has that and we're not really willing to share, but if they're just open-minded and understand that, that every patient contact, yeah. every patient contact is an opportunity to learn and improve. Yeah. So yeah, keeping an open mind and curiosity is fantastic. That was a very interesting point you raised when we were writing the articles um, about EMT training for uh, in Brainscapes Academy uh, was that, you know, after an EMT has safely delivered a patient to the ER um, to follow up with the ER doctors after the fact and see, you know, what was actually wrong with the patient as a way of of completing that learning like you did an assessment but perhaps knowing the outcome of when the actual diagnosis would help you during your next assessment to recognize warning signs. Absolutely. So, yeah, I love that. And point. it's also great to know that you did a good job. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. and they're more than happy to share. They want you to know because it only improves their skills and, and patient outcome, which is ultimately everybody's goal. Mm -hmm. All right. What has been the downfall of the students you've seen fail their EMT certification? I know it's a bit of a discouraging question, but it's good to learn from other people's mistakes. I would think in just a general census, um, they don't feel like they prepared as well as they should. Okay. That the idea that class was done and then 25 days later, they could take this test and do nothing in between mm. was probably a bad idea. Yeah. So they still need to continue to, to practice, study, um, like we said, go back and review the flashcards, review the information, review the notes. Um, mm -hmm. But to walk in cold and take in a test that is starting off to be that intense, just walking into the building. Yeah. Um, and then sitting down and having these numbers counting just <laughs> to, to eliminate that anxiety. Uh, it's just to yeah. be better overprepared than underprepared. Well, that's easy. I mean, that's easy thing to get right. You just put the work in every day, have a you know, have a schedule, daily study habits. So it's not like yeah. there are any left field things that'll knock you off your horse. It seems just 
Just do no, the work. And their goal is not to trick you up. Right. Yeah, ever. But the questions do sometimes seem like, mm, which one's the worst answer? Which one's oh, the yeah. best worst answer? <laughs> As <laughs> always. <laughs> um, but it's not there to trip you up. They do have a, a language that is okay. EMS language. Okay. So, yeah. Are there practice tests and questions that students can get their hands on? Absolutely. The first one I would recommend that they go to is the National Registry website. Yeah. Uh, there are practice exams for EMTs. What's great about their information or their practice exam is that they give you immediate feedback and say, no, this mm -hmm. question, not immediate, but mm -hmm. no, this question was wrong because of these reasons. Oh, cool. So I think in taking that test, it sets you up for what the actual test is going to look like. Right. Okay. Um, but there are multiple um, uh, workbooks, mm. uh, online support. There's a, a company called Lemur Creative that gives practice tests. Uh, the Learning Express workbook, I loved mm. because it doesn't give you multiple choice answers it actually gives you yeah. what are the four things involved in this and if mm. you don't understand that then the multiple choice question that would follow you yeah. wouldn't understand so yeah. um but that's also something they can practice there's online platforms again with some of the textbooks companies mm. this the flashcards and i love the rating system that i'm comfortable with this or i'm not mm. um and how much that's going to help them to just just keep getting nailed with what you're not comfortable with and, and you'll learn it so, right. right yeah or you, you know it gives you an opportunity let's go look back at that again and, right. and how can i understand it better or who can help me in understanding it better who do i need to reach out to possibly well this is the perfect segue to talk about brainscapes uh, in our emt flashcard collection which as i mentioned earlier you authored um and what you mean when you say that you know it nails you with what you're uncomfortable with is that when you do answer a flashcard, it asks you to rate it between one and five, one for I do not know this at all to five, I'm really comfortable with this information, I know it really well. And then depending on how you rate it, if you rate it a one, it shows it to you again and again and again and again until it's really drilled in there. Yes. So I just had to give that little background information to viewers, but please tell our viewers about your pivotal, pivotal role in curating Brainscape's certified flashcard collection and how they can use it as a study tool. Uh, years and years of studying and doing this myself. Mm -hmm. um, I did for several years wrote test questions and understanding mm -hmm. the complexity of, of difficult questions to very simple recall questions up to analysis and how to analyze this question and incorporate critical thinking skills and all those things. So years of, of experience for me in teaching and in test writing and in my own testing, taking my own tests uh, for different courses, that it seemed, I'm going to be honest, it seemed initially like this is really tedious. And then to look back at it, like, no, there's a, there's a purpose in this. Yeah. And as they'll, as they already know, probably before they get access to these cards, that there's a lot of um, mnemonics, there's a lot of uh, just how many, there's seven things in this list, what are they? Yeah. So the cards are, it's not like, here's this one static answer, there's potentially multiple answers with those cards. Mm -hmm. And uh, with medicine, there's several ways to be right. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also several right. ways to be wrong with that. Mm -hmm. but taking that information, incorporating it, having a better understanding that if I gave a card that listed five things, it's not enough to just say, you know what those five things are. It's that you need to understand what those five things do or represent yeah. as well. Yeah. So I was hoping in creating them that if they didn't know that they would take the time to research it a little bit. Right, right. This is really just a know. supplemental study tool to help with the memorization of all of that yes. content. Yeah. Yes. Great. So there you have it, Gerilyn's best advice for doing well throughout EMT school, not only with learning all that content you need to know in order to operate safely and effectively in the field, but also with committing those crucial emergency care skills to muscle memory. And for more on the NR EMT flashcards we talked about in this interview, stay tuned in three, two, one. If you're in EMT school and preparing to take the NREMT certification exam, you've got to get Brainscape certified EMT flashcards in your corner. This collection contains 10 decks and a total of more than 500 adaptive flashcards that are designed to drill you on the key concepts that will likely show up on exam day. With the curriculum condensed down to a super efficient flashcard format, you can use Brainscape anytime, anywhere, and on any device to study more efficiently with spaced repetition. 
Brainscape also has an EMT Academy packed with helpful guides on topics that range from what you can expect from EMT school and how to study more efficiently to the difference between an EMT and a paramedic and how to get the best jobs. So grab the tools Brainscape has for you, study hard and rise to the challenge of emergency medicine.